Thank you, Sam. <laughs> um, the, the next uh, event is Becky Semp talking about her book about, uh, I think it's called The Making a Photographer uh, about Ansel Adams' early work. And uh, um, so she, she'll talk about that. That's gonna be a, an in-person event, uh, but there may be a, a virtual aspect to it. We're still sort of working that out. Um, and I, I believe, <laughs> I was gonna rely on the slide. I believe that's the 9th of October. Um, that's it's right in there somewhere. You can, I'm sorry to be so vague, but I can't quite remember the date. Um, so that's that's coming up, and a couple of other things are coming up. Um, we're going to have uh, the holiday print share uh, to look forward to in December. Uh, we're something we're talking about something for November. It's not quite finalized yet, um, but that'll take us through the end of the year. Uh, so Phil Zimmerman is is. Uh, is our guest today. Uh, Phil has been making photography books since the 1970s and he was active at the Visual Studies Workshop uh, where Keith Smith taught and Joan and Nathan Lyons taught. Um, and I, I, I'm the beneficiary of this, you know, this program in the sense that two members of my MFA thesis committee were products of the Visual Studies Workshop as well, Mark Platt and, and Bill Jenkins. Um, so when we think about photography books, there's a tendency to sort of think, well, we're talking about monographs, um, the kind of thing that uh, Bill Fuller did a few years ago with uh, introductory text, some images with titles in a nicely designed package. Um, but today we're going to kind of broaden the frame of reference to include um, artist books, limited edition books, books with odd uh, kinds of structures or bindings or things like that. So I'm sure that Phil will also touch on monographs and where they, where they are, but it's just a, you know, if you remember back in February, I think it was, we talked to um, Andy Burgess from Dark Spring Press. And the, those, those are examples of monographs, kind of bodies of work put into a book format. Um, but I think we're gonna, gonna, as I say, broaden the sort of perspective um, on, on the medium of photography appearing in between covers today. Um, so Phil has recently retired from teaching at the University of Arizona down in Tucson where he's, he's presenting from today. Um, and I think I'll just let him take it away. Thanks Richard. Thank you. Um, okay, let me let me see if I can bring up my uh, share screen here. Um, okay, I got. Oops, um, I, I mean, have this at the very beginning, and then let me go. And that, tell me if this is. Uh, does that look good for you all? Yeah, that looks yes. great. Yep. Is that full? Is it full screen? No, it well, no. It's, yeah, it's, you've got one more little thing you could do to make it full screen. Um, hmm. I tried uh, this yesterday and it worked. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's adequate, but we can see yeah. the, all the pages on the left. Yeah, I don't. I actually don't want. That. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, is that it, at Macintosh that you're on? An apple? Yes, yes, I Try am. Try Apple yeah. L. Okay. <laughs> that didn't work. Uh huh. Um, um, well, maybe I'll have to do with with this. Um, uh, shoot, let me try one more thing here. Uh, yeah, that's. Let's see. Um, it says full screen. Yeah. yeah. Edit full. Slide only. There we go. There we are. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get rid of that. Um, okay. So um, uh, Richard and I had been talking about what to try to cover today. And um, so he has pretty much mentioned uh, that today. I'm trying, I'm going to do a sort of little 
um, typology of, of photo books and uh, photo-based artist books, which is kind of what I do. Um, and I say in the title bias, because obviously this is my own view and it doesn't agree with a lot of other people, but um, I'm, I'm gonna give my, my view of it anyway. Um, and, uh-oh, now why isn't it advancing? Um, um, oh, I can't believe this. <laughs> right. uh, uh, oh, oh, I know what it is. Okay. There you go. Uh, okay. Th that's not um, full are you Are any of you getting like some squares on the left there from where the, the, the meeting people are? Are little dark squares? Because I tried it yesterday. And this, some, looks, this looks good to me. There's yeah. good? okay, good, good. We'll, we'll, just, we'll go with that. Yeah. So um, in this presentation, I'm going to be using the, the term photo book work, which sounds a little strange. But um, by that, I mean a book that uses photography with or without text in such a way that the book is the primary, primary creative medium used by the artist photographer for that piece. And I'll, I'll go into that more shortly. Um, in other words, the bookwork is used merely as a um, is, is not used merely as a portfolio of collected paginated photographic images, which is, for me, a sort of um, you know a description of what a monograph, a photo book monograph is. So it's not merely an alternative presentation form from a gallery show or from a museum show, and it's a time-based, intimate medium that creates an expressive dialogue between the artist, photographer, and the viewer. Um, a very, very brief sort of history of the development of the book form. Obviously, this, these are clay tablets, um, Egyptian papyrus scroll, uh, Chinese mulberry paper scroll, an Arabic scroll on parchment, a Jewish Torah scroll on parchment, corded South Indian palm leaf book, and then around the third century AD, the Copts, a Christian sect in Southern Egypt and Northern Ethiopia, developed the Codex book. And a Codex book is the book that we're all familiar with. It's a book that's bound on one edge, the spine, and has a very, what we think of as a traditional way of going through a book with uh, regular leaves that are wrecked over so and so on. It's another view of um, I'm going to see if I can get out of, I, I'm, part of my screen is being blocked by all of the people in the room. I don't know if I can get rid of that or not. Oh, here's my tech support. Hold on one second. <laughs> How do I get rid of these, these so I can see the whole slide? I don't know if you can. Okay. Where's well, my I, mouse? I know you can't see the mouse. Unfortunately. Okay. It's okay. I can deal with it. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> uh, an illuminated codex. So this is uh, a little later, 14th century. Um, and then I wanted to mention a little bit about um, uh, the interest in eBooks, which I don't really think of as books at all. It's, it's publishing, but not necessarily books for me. Um, and this was uh, gained a lot of um, interest in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, things, well, they, there still are some, but there are a number of them that came out that you either went to a website or they were on DVDs or even earlier on laser discs. And um, the main problem with this is that you are at the mercy of the technology, which is both software and hardware. And every time that you, you know, go through an iteration in the software, or the hardware, you can no longer view the, the work. Um, I don't know if any of you remember Voyager, they were very big in the 90s and they published a number of uh, works. Some of them they didn't call books, but this is an example of one that they actually did call a photo book. And it, they're unviewable now. The software doesn't exist. The hardware is not the right hardware. So uh, books on paper are gonna last hundreds of years and, and are not dependent on that viewing software or hardware. And so my uh, sort of mantra is that nothing beats ink on paper or pigment. If you're talking about, um, say, inkjet or 
Um, I mean, even you can even think of cyanotype or whatever. So um, now this is the section I was mentioning, which is um, doing a very brief uh, survey on the typologies of photo books and photo book works. So for me, the first category is a more photo book than photo book work. Again, I'm using that term photo book work as uh, more of an artist book where the book is, is, the, is the work, not the collection of photographs. And some books don't fit neatly in any single category, but anyway, it's, this is a start. So and this is the first most basic one is collected single images or what essentially is a bound portfolio. So I try to always mention that a book is not the same as a portfolio of images. Um, the very, very first photo book is really is pretty much that. It's a collection of, of single images. It's Anna Atkins' uh, 1847 book um, on British algae which is um, a cyanotype book. Um, there she is, Anna Atkins. Uh, for a long time, uh, people thought of Fox Talbot as the first person, but actually Anna Atkins was the first person to make a photo book. This was a show that was at the New York um, Public Library, I think two years ago, maybe three years ago now. And they showed various editions of that book um, open to different pages. It's just a gorgeous book, um, but it is kind of a, just a collection of single images, um, but they're, they're amazingly beautiful. I have a couple of photographs of them. Um, these don't look quite as nice as the ones that were displayed at the, at the um, New York Public Library. Um, and then this was for many years considered the very first photo book, which was The Pencil of Nature, um, Henry Fox Talbot's book. Um, and that again is a collection of, of just images that he had done in the 1840s. So the next category would be publisher designer sequenced photos. So early on, um, a lot of photo books, um, the photographer did not necessarily have a lot of say in how the images were sequenced and so on. Uh, usually it was the publisher or even a designer had the say. Um, a classic monograph, which is an example of that type, uh, is Deanne Arbus's book. Um, this is a fantastic book. Um, it came out the year after she died. And um, it's really, it is kind of a, a collection of, you know, greatest hits. And, you know, uh, th that's the way a lot of photographs are today. And I'm going to talk a little more about it, but this is the classic format. A line of text on the left, image on the right. Um, so the next is a slide, as we're going along, the, the artist or photographer, artist slash photographer um, has more input. So as far as I'm concerned, that means uh, increased authorship, right? So here the photographer has primary input, but the photographs still could be, and often have been arranged as images on a gallery wall. Um, nothing wrong with that, but they're not necessarily conceived of as a book. Um, wonderful book, Walker Evans's American Photographs that the, uh, came out. Um, and Walker Evans did insist on having uh, um, a say in how the images were sequenced. So he did have a lot of input here. Uh, but again, it is sort of, um, I don't know, he would never call it greatest hits, but they're, you know, his photographs sequenced in a way that uh, the classic monograph uh format where linotype on the left blank page image on the right side um this book still feels kind of fresh even though it was from 1938 so i'm, I'm not uh you know assigning any kind of value judgments here these are these are, are great books they just have maybe different intentions <clears throat> um by the way if anyone wants to say anything pipe up <laughs> and just okay. stop me so because i'm just going to keep plowing along so um if you, anyone wants to say anything sometimes it's better to ask a question in in the throes of the images rather than say waiting towards the end okay so the americans 
one of the most famous photo books of all time um, and sequencing was done by Frank. And he spent a great deal of time editing, 1958. I think there was the, um, uh, does anyone know? Um, I think the, was it Grove Editions in Paris that did it? I think the, um, I think it was 56 for that one. Uh, but the, anyway, the, the American uh, version was, I think was 58. But again, uh, image on the right, line of text uh, on the left, blank page. Uh, on this one, uh, this uh, next category, if you want to call it that, um, is artist photographer creates photo bookwork. Now, this is not just a collection of images. The work can only exist as a bookwork. This is very different. And uh, in this case, often the images are made for the book. They don't really exist for another purpose. They're not meant for a gallery show or uh, some other uh, intention. They're, they're intended for the book. Um, this is, I find this really fascinating that F Robert Frank did that earlier book, The Americans, and The Lines of My Hand, because they're so different. And of course, that happens with any artist as time goes by, the work can change, but this is so much looser. And um, he showed some of his process. And in, in fact, you can see here, many pages looked a little like uh, looking at a light table. And he included autobiographical text on it. Um, they're much more personal. You can see the one here with Mary has a film strip, uh, like cut right out of a you know roll of 35 millimeter film on there. Um, some of the page spreads were very loosely collaged. So he actually put the photographs on newspaper of the time. Um, he has little personal notes um, and it's just a very different feel uh, than uh, nothing, not to take away anything from the Americans because the Americans is such an amazing book, but this is just, it's like night and day. Uh, here you can see the edges of the photographs that were put down to be, um, to have the half tones made on a, on a process camera. Um, so it's, it's again, very loose and even, does something with the typography, which is something the photographers in general don't like to do. Um, uh, you know, again, I don't want to, you know, sort of paint everybody with the same brush, but in general, uh, um, photographers really uh, try to minimize um, the type to be, you know, sort of not get in the way of the images. And yet here he is breaking it up and making really something of the type as being part of the book. And then here you have more contact sheet like page spreads. Um, yes. Uh, can I ask you a question? Are these pages, are these photographic pages, are these photographic prints that the, the pages we're seeing here? Uh, these, these are all um, photographs of the book, which are made from his photographs. Um, I don't know if that's what you meant. Well, is it, is this a published book? I guess. Oh yes, yes. Uh, this is not. Yes. A, yeah. Okay. Um, you know what? I can't remember now. Uh, Mark, do you remember who was the publisher of this one? I, was it? It might have been Aperture. No, I, I don't. I'm afraid I don't remember yeah, that. I, I, I have it here, but I, I don't really want to take the time to look it up right now. But I think it might have been Aperture. Um, yes. So this is offset printed. Okay. From from his photos, yeah, that's that's actually a good point because it's a little hard to tell there. They look like they're just, uh, you know, black and white silver gelatin prints thrown down, <laughs> but it's not. It's it's actually a printed book. Gotcha. Um, so notations and passing, I think, is a really important book too because um, uh, Nathan was really thinking in different in a different way here. In fact. He signals that at the very beginning by saying that he's visual. It's visualized by Nathan Lyons. He doesn't say photographed or anything. Like it's visualized. Um, and uh, Nathan was a, an English major as an undergraduate. And the book is, I think of it as um, being formatted very much like a like a literary work. Uh, there are sort of chapters with an introduction. Um, the way the pacing works. Uh, he even has, he re returns to themes 
for instance, this little image here with the cloth blowing in the woods uh, reappears a little later here. This is not sequential. I mean, I'm missing a few pages. I'm just sort of trying to make a point here, but it's not the same image either. It's it's a different image. And um, you'll have blank pages, which often kind of denotes a um, obviously a pause, but they're almost like chapters the way they work. Um, it's it's very different than than uh, a monograph, and and um, I think it's a really important book in terms of the way uh, the book is sequenced and the way the photographs are 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 viewed. Um, this is a I, I've never seen this book in um, actuality. This is by William Klein, and it's pretty early, 1956. Life is good and good for you in New York. Um, this was a facsimile published by Errata Editions in 2010. So the images are, are from that facsimile. Um, but William Klein was actually a painter. He wasn't a photographer. And, but um, he did a number of, of photographic books, but um, he, ne he never called himself a photographer. He called himself just, uh, just an artist because he did work in a lot of media. Anyway, really interesting book in terms of the way it's visualized, how the photographs are uh, placed on the page. <coughs> Some of the pages go across the gutter. <coughs> Excuse me. Others are, you have different views of the same event, which is not a normal, you know, um, way that people were thinking in the 50s in terms of photographic books. And uh, so anyway, I, I, again, I'm sorry, I'd love to even just do a whole thing on any of these, but I, I'm going to keep moving. Um, books where text and image are equally important. Um, so for the first time, text is not merely used to title the photograph. Um, this is a very interesting book by Bertolt Brecht done in 55 called War Primer. And um, he uses, it's a very unusual format where he has found images of the Second World War. And then he, he has the, the caption. <clears throat> and also um, he writes, uh, Bertolt Brecht wrote these little poems below it. Uh, this has gone through a number of printing, I think printers, printings, and you can still buy this book. Um, anyway, um, then he has the page number right in the center of the left. And then occasionally, I don't have them here, but he has, uh, as you can see here, sometimes you'll have text on there, but most of the time it's on the right. Um, the, the, the little poems that are there that he wrote are very sardonic and some, some are actually kind of sarcastic. And, and um, it, it's a really, it's a fascinating book. Um, I wanted to also mention at least one book where there are collaborations between the designer and the photographer, and that can often be very fruitful. Um, a great example is Marshall McLuhan and Quentin Fiore. And Quentin Fiore was a designer who just died two years ago at the age of 99. Um, the, the original title of the book was Medium is Message, and then it came back from the printer where they had it massage, and uh, Marshall McLuhan loved that. The fact that it was the meeting of the massage, so that he said, "No, leave it. We, we're going to leave that in." And they had a very close relationship in the way the the book was visualized. Uh, Quentin Fiore uh, either commissioned photographs or found photographs, and um, it's a really terrific book. And there was a um, paperback. I'm, my copy is obviously very um, old and kind of beat up. I, I actually bought this when I was in high school, um, but you can see how they're, he's thinking of the book. I love this image with the two thumbs holding the book open. And um, anyway, um, really interesting collaboration there. Uh, the photographers are, are not really um, uh, upfront in terms of their authorship. Uh, you know, as I said, there are a lot of them are found, but they are, I do think of this as a you know, photo-based book, photo-based artist book. Uh, it also has very interesting, because Quentin Fiore was a designer, the, the type treatment is really interesting. Um, this is a very peculiar little genre, but it, it is one that a lot of photo historians now consider as being, uh, you know, definitely a, a, a category, even if it's a minor one. 
um, fiction with embedded photographs. And it doesn't have to be necessarily fiction. Um, uh, probably the most famous is Nadja by Andre Breton. And that's from 1928. So it goes way back. And these photographs are, are in, are a really important part of the text, and they're they're selected by Breton. Um, in fact, he took some of the photographs supposedly, and um, so it, they're not illustrations. They they actually are part of the book. Well, of course, illustrations are, but um, the, you know they're they're actually mentioned in in the book itself. And the same with W. G. Sebald, who is um, you know. Uh, unfortunately, he died fairly young, uh, but um, the 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 number of books that he put out have been have really gained in in sort of stature and notoriety over the years. Um, same thing where the 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 text actually talks about the photographs; they're part of the book. Um, this is another one that he did, Austerlitz, with images, and um, I, don't, I can't go through the text, but he actually, the book does not work without the, the photographs. Um, this has become such a kind of interesting category that there's actually a website uh, called Photographic Embedded Fiction, and they come out with an annual list of all the books. Um, somebody who's following in this whole tradition is Teju Cole, who you probably may know because he's a very uh, um, well-known photographer writer today where you know the photo and the and the and the text, the writing are intrinsically connected. Um, I just checked to see if this web WordPress site was still up and it is. Um, in fact as I, I took this screen grab, probably six or seven years ago, but um, it, they're, it's still active and posting new ones. Uh, and it's a really interesting website. Um, another category, appropriated photos that form a narrative. Um, so the picture editor is, is acts as the artist, photographer, bookwork maker. Um, if that sounds a little confusing, I'll show you some examples. Um, and there's a pretty wide variety of, of examples here. Um, this is a, a book that's pretty well known by Larry Sutton, Mike Man Larry Sultan, and Mike Mandela. It was reprinted um, not so long ago, and um, uh, it, it also uh, was a show that went around with all the images. Um, and uh, it's interesting that um, you're going to have Becky Senf next because um, Mike Mandel just published a new book called Zone Eleven which um, also collects images, but they're all images of um, uh, Ansel Adams' commercial work, which is what is what this book consists of. They went around to various corporate and advertising uh, archives and selected images to form um, a visual narrative using those photographs. Um, and um, I, I have not gotten my copy of the new book uh, by Mike, uh, the, the Zone 11 one, but I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Uh, Alex Sweetman, Survivors, another VSW person. Um, and this was when he was in Chicago where he took um, very small photographs from the back of the Chicago Reader, the personals, pers personal ads, is that, I think that's what it's called. Anyway, um, they're blown up halftone images from the back. And as it goes along, the photographs get weirder and weirder. I don't, I don't know about weirder. I, well, anyway, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't categorize them. But um, uh, there's a whole, there's a lot of books that are similar to this. And I've actually cut a bunch of them out because I was afraid this talk was going to go too long. But in other words, Luke Sante's uh, he also did a book called Evidence. I don't know if anyone knows that one. Diane Keaton has done a, a couple of books uh, using uh, found tabloid pictures. This is, these are the ones from the Los Angeles Herald Express and, and um, extinct newspaper from in LA. Um, and uh, she forms this sort of very strange narrative of, of LA. It's very cinematic. Um, and some of them, it's hard to believe they're not kind of Hollywood photographs. 
Uh, Marvin Hefferman and Carol Kazmarek did, I think, three different books of found images like this. I, I, I think they're really great. Uh, this one is called Love is Blind from 1990. And again, all found industrial and, and uh, commercial photographs that form this very bizarre kind of narrative. Um, there's Mia Farrow in the left and um, uh, on the right is Liza Minnelli and there's Fabio and Dr. Ruth. <laughs> and then that goes to uh, Jonestown and then OJ. Uh, it's, it's, I really like that book. Anyway, um, a German photographer, a uh, conceptual person, um, he's not, he doesn't actually make images himself. He does a lot of stuff with in, fa images found on the internet, but he did a, sil a series of builder books uh, where he collected images and formed a, sort of a, 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 a series. They're, they're quite nice and very reasonably priced. I don't know if they're still in print or not. Um, I love this book. This is guy, Eric Kessels is a Dutch conceptual artist um, who uses uh, photographs, again, mostly found, either found in reality, like at flea markets or found off the internet. Um, this one uh, was from a, a shoebox full of photographs that he found in Barcelona in the early 2000s. And it, they are photographs of one woman and they're of her entire life. So uh, a very natural title for the book is in almost every picture because this woman is in almost every picture. And it's really, it's kind of moving because it starts out in the fifties. Um, again, I'm not showing all the images, but as you go through, you see her aging <coughs> and they have, the only caption goes back to that same kind of format, but the intent of the photographs is very different from obviously from a monograph. Um, you can see as she gets older and older, uh, I don't know if I have them all in the right order, but, and that's the back cover, which is not actually the oldest one, but, um, Okay, this is getting into a little more into the weeds here, but um, creative photo anthropological book work, quite a mouthful. These are usually interpretations of historical image research, but can be archived photo material or self-generated photographs from a significant site. A uh, really great example of that is uh, Michael Lessie's uh, Wisconsin Death Trip, another person with a VSW connection. Um, he did this book actually while he was at VSW. Um, and it's the story of a small Wisconsin uh, town. And he went there, he went into the archives and sort of did all this research and found this very dark, weird history of the town. Um, I, it's a terrific book if you don't know it. I highly recommend uh, looking into it if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Um, another book similar, uh, a little similar, Conversations with the Dead by Danny Lyon. Um, these are photographs of, uh, of prison life. Um, and when it starts out, it just seems like, okay, he's taking photographs of the penitentiary, but then it gets into stories of the prisoners. Uh, they, and um, so it's much more, uh, it, it almost becomes like, like a collaborative thing with the prisoners. Um, another biographical, semi-journalistic book work, another kind of odd, a uh, little category, but I, uh, some of these, I just couldn't figure out how to kind of make them fit into other ones. But so some of these books could fit well in other categories like photo anthropology, but they're often diaristic in nature. And a really great example of that is the end of the game. Peter Beard, who again, another one who just died a few years ago. Uh, this book went through, I think, eight or 10 different editions. Um, the original was published in 63. So it was a long time ago. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating book. He grew up in Kenya and in Africa in general, he traveled all over Africa, but I think he actually spent most of his time in Kenya and, um, they're all his photographs, but it's much more than just a book of his photographs. There's also obviously historical photographs of, of uh, the game and hunting and so on. But one of the things that makes it interesting as a book is uh, he, he has all kinds of writing in it and marginalia of little 
um, uh, little uh, drawings and artifacts and so on. You can see here kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, it's a beautiful book and the earlier editions were done in sheet fed gravure. So they're gorgeous books. Um, I'm pretty sure it's still in print. Um, someone who saw that book and got a lot of influences from there because I've talked to Bill about this uh, is I want to take picture, which is a pretty well-known book too. It's, it's been gone into two editions. And um, these are about uh, Bill Burke's trip to Cambodia and Northern Thailand um, and his recording of a lot of uh, the sort of the, um, what happened after Pol Pot took power and, and um, soldiers who lost limbs um, from mines and so on. It, it's very personal. And it's a really great book. And again, he has little pictures of uh, things that he collected along the way, um, maps and so on. But you can definitely see an influence from Peter Beard and also from Lines of My Hand, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, Robert Frank book, which he also uh, credits with the influences. So he has money in there and lots. And then this reminds me a lot of, of, of um, the, the William Klein and the Robert Frank books. Uh, and then he has the duct tape. I don't know, I really, I really like that book. Um, I actually helped with the production on that book. So I have a soft spot for that anyway. So uh, Susan Micellis um, has done many, many books uh, as a photojournalist, but I love this book. Um, she told me that this is the book that she's sold the least copies of, of any of her books, which I find kind of sad because I think it's one of her best. And um, it's called Encounters with the Danny. And uh, that's a tribe. And it also has some of those same features. So, I mean, part of this is probably my personal taste. Uh, I like this kind of um, journalistic, personal um, way of looking at the pages of the book and how they work. Um, so I'll just show you a few examples and they have sort of facsimile printing of the, some of the clippings and it's a, it's a really good book. Um, This is a uh, very different. Um, Sophie Ristel Huber is, um, I think, is she Austrian or German? I can't remember. Anyway, this book was published by, um, in France, um, it's called Fit, which means done. Um, and it's about the first Gulf War where she was a photographer. And um, she, after the war was over, she went out into the desert. There was that long road where all the leftover blown up um, tanks and so on were, were located. And it's, it's a devastating book. It's just, um, you know, uh, you can see the, 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 the leftovers of war and, and um, it's just a very small book, but it's just very, very powerful. And then at the end, this is the only other text in the whole book. There's a sort of rant that she did about going at the end, going on, going and taking those photographs at the end of the war, uh, the first Gulf War. Uh, photo bookworks as experiential evidence. I only have a couple of examples here, but um, I just want to mention that because again, it's a use of photography in book form that um, I, I find kind of interesting. Hamish Fulton is a, a sort of conceptual artist, British, who um, his thing is doing walks, often in the UK, usually in the Lake District or somewhere. This one actually is, is not there, but, um, and he photographs, that's his sort of thing is he, he um, the, the re recording of the walk is the photograph, which is then printed into a book, which they, he sells. And he also often does things with that are sort of poetic with type, they're not all like this. Um, this is one he did in a walk in Japan 
seven one day walks on Hikosan. And then uh, again, the photograph is, is the record of the walk. Um, they're pretty interesting, I think. Um, so now I'm getting into conceptual photo book works. Um, I have a note here saying, well, is this a way of bridging the gap between photography and blue chip fine art? And of course the most famous one is Sir Ed Ruscha, who did, I think, 15 or 16 books like this. Um, he's very dismissive of photography, but he has used it a lot. And um, this is one of many of uh, 34 parking lots and they're very deadpan. They, they do what they say. They, they, uh, the most famous one is um, 26 gasoline stations, which were taken along from route six, on Route 66 between LA where he lived and uh, his parents' home in Oklahoma City. Um, nine swimming pools, um, that's, that's what they are. They're sort of very um, uh, matter of fact images uh, that he does sequence and and um, probably maybe his most famous is every every uh, building along Sunset Strip. Am I? I think I got the title slightly wrong there. But anyway, um, and amazingly enough, he still photographs it every year. He has a van, or for a while I think he used a pickup truck, and he he has somebody drive the length of the Sunset Strip and he photographs it. Now, I think there are a couple years that he missed, but. Um, most of the time, he's been continuing to do that ever since the 60s. Um, he did two books. One was called Various Small Fires, and another one was called Various Small Fires and Milk, which is a very typical Ed Ruscha title. Um, and these are the, some of the various small fires. Um, I wanted to show this one because um, that whole Ed Ruscha uh, format of photo book um, has been copied and mimicked and made fun of. And I think this is probably one of the, the best. It's by Scott McCarney and it's called Various Fires and MLK instead of Milk. And um, this was done in 2010, long after Ed Ruscha's original. But um, when you first see the images, they're all of fires, but they're of looting and rioting. And, and then at the very end, uh, there's a, that's the MLK instead of milk. So it's a very clever uh, way of commenting on Richet's thing, but also making a statement um, about the content of the book. I, I thought it was really good. Um, anyway, Ronnie Horn, um, not really always considered a photographer, but she uses photography a lot. I mean, she does obviously all kinds, I mean, sculpture and so on. But um, this is probably one of her more famous um, artist books called You Are the Weather. And there are photographs of a Icelandic woman who she befriended. And um, uh, the, the title refers to the fact that um, the way that they're photographed in some of the geothermal pools in Iceland reflect the sky and the weather uh, in Iceland at the time they're taken. So it's it's they're not really about just the photo the the subject the the model, but the way the light reflects off her. I mean, it's a very conceptual idea, and it's 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 a very interesting book. Um, and it's also been shown in a gallery uh, in exactly the same format, lined up on a wall. Uh, but the book um, is a is, is kind of a different way of looking at the images to me. Um, it's much more intimate, obviously, which is one of the nice things about books, um, which I think works very well with this subject matter. You can see how different the light is here. Some are black and white, mostly color. Um, I put this in just, it's kind of a goof, but I, I kind of like it. I don't know if you remember um, in, I think 2008 or nine, the FBI, um, uh, who had taken apart the Unabomber's uh, cottage, was it Montana or Colorado? Anyway, wherever it was, they sold all the items online uh, that were collected, which is very weird to me. Uh, but they, they had an online auction and they sold off his, all the stuff that was in there. Um, so this uh, artist, Lydia Moyer, 
decided she would make a, a, a version of the Unabomber's wife, who of course didn't really exist. She sort of made up this character and took photographs of all the artifacts as if they were being auctioned off online also, but from sort of a female perspective. Uh, I, I love this one. Uh, it's very obviously very tongue in cheek. <laughs> Um, Alfredo Jar or Jar, I was not sure how to say that. Um, 100 times Gwen. Um, another very conceptual piece. Um, he's usually thought of as more of a sculptor, I think, although he works in all kinds of media. <clears throat> um, in 1994, he was at um, one of the resettlement camps uh, for uh, the Cambodian kids in Thailand. Uh, who were orphaned by Pol Pot's um, uh, massacre of uh, the Cambodian populace. And he met this little girl um, and uh, she would walk, walked around the camps with him holding his hand. And he took four photographs of her. These are the four. And um, that's all he had. And then he left the camps and he tried to find her again and could never find her. And the sort of the, that experience of this little girl looking at him and following him around the camp stayed with him. So he made this kind of uh, homage to, to the little girl and printed the four photographs in sequence and rotation a hundred times with a beautiful little uh, text at the end. So that's, that's, I guess that's the fourth one. Anyway, um, it's a really, nice book you still can buy it for reasonable a very reasonable price so i i think it's a really beautiful little book um john baldessari um another person like ed Rocher who used photographs a lot um although he's not really considered a photographer but this is a book that uses found hollywood images and then he writes um text and it, it's one of those books where the flaps work so you can reconstruct the sentences. You can see how, um, how they're made up. Anyway, um, I, again, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I, I think I'm maybe too slow here. Uh, photo illustrated story, storytelling. I'm gonna try to pick things up. Um, Dwayne Michaels has done a bunch of these. This is actually a compilation, so I, they're not the actual books, but you can get an idea of them. Uh, they form little stories, which is what Dwayne Michaels does. Um, these are uh, photographs as illustration by Gregory Crudson uh, with text where the texts were given to Crudson and then he made images for the book. So they're illustrations, but the book is kind of more than just an illustrated book. Book. I mean, it's kind of kind of a nice little book. Um, this is a terrific book by Monica Holler, Riley and his story about the Iraq War. A friend of hers named Riley came back from uh, the photographs are his, so they're not her photographs, but she uh, made this narrative. It's a very fat book, um, a lot of pages, um, and some of the text is Riley's text. Um, he was a medic there. And um, some of the text is Monica Holler's. Um, anyway, very, very powerful book. Um, again, I think it's still in print and worth getting. Contemporary Photo Book Works, Pushing the Boundaries and Learning from Artists Book World. Um, this is the classic uh, book work, photo book work to me, because this was, um, this is really conceived of as just a book. These photographs would never be able to work in any other form than in a book. And Michael Snow was um, made only a few books. He's still alive. He's like a hundred years old. Uh, he's Canadian. He's usually thought of as, um, as an experimental filmmaker, but uh, he was commissioned by the Nova Scotia School of Art and Design to make this this book work in, in 1975 and you enter a door and as you enter you see him enter that's the door on the right right the the page is turned and you see his back entering this house and then you see him coming from both directions so you see him coming and then as he goes by you see the photographer taking the picture of him walking it's very sort of self-referential 
And so there's the photographer on one side and the photographer on the other side taking the pictures of Michael Snow walking basically through the book. Uh, then he he waits, he comes to a typewriter and he, then he puts on a record. I've, I've unfortunately had to really um, uh, edit this way down. Then the book flips over and it's, it's actually right side up if you turn the book over. And if this is the other side of the book, there's another door. It's as if he's walked through the house and this is the back door. Mm -hmm. A little hard to describe, but I don't know if you can get the picture. It's a really interesting book conceptually. Uh, it's just been reprinted last year, or is it last year or year before, uh, by some uh, publisher in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I actually bought the reprint too, because it's in a lot better shape than my, the original copy. Um, Ken O'Hara, people think maybe he's um, Irish or something, but he's actually Japanese. It's Kenji O'Hara, not O'Hara. Uh, but um, he spent um, a year in Times Square in 1969 uh, taking photographs of people in Times Square with a flash very close up. And um, it's, it's a fantastic book. It's been reprinted a couple of times. This is by Tashin. And um, it's really intense. Every one of the photographs is like right in their face with a flash. And... Um, you know, he has said that the idea was to try to convey the universality of man, you know, that that um, we're, we're all one people. And um, it's a great book. Um, Richard and I were talking briefly uh, before we started about Keith's book, Structure of the Visual Book. And I just want to put in a little plug for Keith's book here. Um, it's a really great book uh, in terms of just you know, doesn't have to do necessarily with just photography, but talks a lot about sequencing and rhythm and so on. So um, I recommend that one. And this is a book of his um, called Pattern to Part, uh, which is a two color book, uh, red and, and blue duotones. Uh, so again, a, a little bit of idea of some of his work. He's done a, you know, a lot of work in his, he's, he's now 83, still alive and kicking. Luckily, uh, Dieter wrote um, another sort of blue chip conceptual artist who's done all kinds of really fantastic uh, books that use photographs in unusual ways. Um, he does a lot of stuff with sort of reproductions of photographs uh, using the halftone imagery. Uh, this is band 10, which just means um, uh, uh, volume 10 of, he did a whole series um, and the original uh, where there, he goes to printers and he often collects some of their waste sheets. He has all kinds of ways of working. He's a really interesting artist. Christian Boltanski, unfortunately, just died relatively recently also. Um, this is one of his more famous books, which is sort of a reverie on, on memory and uh, the Holocaust and um, the Second World War. Um, really wonderful uh, book and it's um, it, a lot, most of his books are tied into shows that he has um, with with the images. Uh, there's another terrific book, "Raise a Laugh" um, by Richard Billingham. He did this when he was 25 or 26 years old. Um, published by Scalo, uh, he grew up in uh, what are called council flats, or like the projects in the UK. Um, and his, his family, he comes from a very sort of dysfunctional family. Um, these are his, this is his mother and father. And his father is a terrible alcoholic. This is them eating in bed while they're watching TV. And one of the things that I really liked about this book is the way he, he, he does something that's very unusual for most photographers where he really, he's, he, he considers the pacing, the, the images are really hard to take. I mean, they're, they're pretty grim. So every once in a while, he'll throw in an image like this as a rest, which I, I love. It's just like, oh, okay, these, the viewer needs to take a little break here. So, and then the next one, there's daddy drinking, I don't know what, some kind of alcohol. Here he is stumbling and falling over. And then you get another little bird picture out the window or somewhere. And then, you know, here he is passed out in the, in the loo. Um, another interesting uh, uh, 
uh, Clifton Metter has a um, undergraduate degree in photography from RISD, but I think he's one of the more interesting people making uh, photographic books because he's not He's, he is a photographer. All these photographs are are his, but he was, he's also a typographer and um, his books are just really interesting in the way that the text and the image work. Um, I don't know if any of you know that sort of Mexican, uh, it's a Mexican story called uh, Pedro Paramo. He's, it's about, it's a classic Mexican story about a, a man who discovers that he's dead. And this book is similar to that. Uh, it's a book within a book. It's a very complex story. And then as the as it goes along, you can see here, it leaves you with an overwhelming question, am I dead? And as you go along, you realize that, that the world is sort of, the images are deconstructing. And, uh, you know, he is, this, the, the narrator, the protagonist is dead. And as the images go along, you can see the photographic part of it sort of disappears. And uh, what's left are kind of the, it's almost like the matrix or something, you know, where you see behind the reality of the images. Anyway, interesting book. Um, Fred, Brad Freeman, Music. I wanted to throw this in because um, it's an interesting example of somebody who's um, using uh, the production process in a very loose way. These, this is an offset book, but it's all printed by Brad. Um, on an offset press. And a lot of the way that the treatments of the way everything is done is very um, uh, influenced by uh, the process of, of uh, the way the images are halftoned and stripped and so on. Uh, another blue chip artist, Doug Aitken, um, works in all kinds of media. Uh, I think probably is again, probably considered a sculptor more than anything else, but not, probably not good to pigeonhole him there. But this is a terrific book, again, in print. I think it costs like $25 or $27. Alpha, <clears throat> it's a shaped book. So it's been cut in this shape. And it's this, it's this story about him being stranded at an airport uh, where his flight was canceled and he's in a hotel room and he's looking out there and the musings and he can't fall asleep. Um, it's just beautifully paced and the way he works with the shape of the pages is just really interesting. Um, so you can see, I'm going to go through them very quickly, but you can sort of see that's the hotel room um, looking out through the curtains and then uh, this is the boarding call, final boarding call, then that he's on the jet and he flies away. Uh, Francois Duchamp, um, this was a book that was, um, uh, came out of his concerns of um, Obama's uh, drone warfare. So the, it, it's a, it comes in a box like this, you open it up and there's three volumes inside. Um, and uh, there are different takes on the idea of drones and uh, what, what it means in terms of uh, warfare and so on. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go through quicker because this is, um, I'm, I realize I'm already one hour in and I still got a ways to go. Um, Susan K. Grant uh, did this book. Um, this is digitally produced um, and uh, it's uh, text by her. Um, photographs are uh, silhouettes, um, and um, this was, I don't think the edition was very large, but I think it's a very elegant little book. Elizabeth Tenard, another VSW grad, um, though she's, she's Dutch, um, did this book uh, using a found photographs from the Visual Studies Work Workshop Resource Center, so they're all found photographs, and then uh, uh, the, 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 the text is from, um, a, so I think it's a poem that, that she found. Anyway, it, it's quite nice. Um, again, I'm sorry to go so quickly, but um, uh, I probably should cut some of this out. Anyway, Christian Patterson, this was a huge hit in terms of the photo book world a few years ago. Uh, wow, 11 years ago? Could it be? I guess it is. Um, this is already, I think it's in its fourth edition. And he does change them slightly with each new edition. So you have to buy every one of them to get the full thing, which, uh, you know, okay, that's fine. 
Uh, he's not the only one who's done that. But um, anyway, it's a very interesting story. It's sort of a Bonnie and Clyde story, but the way he tells it is it's very clever and well done. Um, he has little bits of ephemera in there, uh, like notes and so on, wallpaper, uh, very, very well done. Uh, I love Paul Graham. Uh, this is um, probably one of his best books, A Shimmer of Possibility. Um, and uh, this is interesting in the way he tells, it, it's very uh, cinematic. And he, if you'll notice the image on here, he's he's hyper aware of the, of the page, uh, the surface of the page, the size of the book, where the image appears on the page. Um, and there's two stories going on here. This is a, a store. And then there's a guy over here cutting the grass. I mean, you can almost, and then he goes back and forth uh, and you'll see how the image works going across the page. Um, anyway, he's, he's come to the CCP here in Tucson and talked. It's probably one of the best lectures I've ever heard. It was, did you see that Mark, that when he was here? No, I missed that because I was out of town, but I, I wanted to just comment on this book because what the thing that was so cool about this was it was 12 separate books. Right. Put in a slipcase, and then they steadily reprinted it into one book. But I thought the 12 separate books were astounding. Yes, and then they redid it recently. And yeah. I would have loved to have bought it, but it was so expensive. I, I just couldn't afford it. Well, the issue library had it out in the stacks, and I told them, you got to put this in. The oh, yeah. Book. It's <laughs> worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. As, as, as the, was there seven? How many were there? There was 12, and one, wow. of the, one of the books only had one picture in it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's great. That's great. And they, and they, they, weren't they, were, they were color-coded, but they weren't sequenced. It was very bizarre. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, they're great. They're kind of mundane, but, man, uh, they're just uh, – this is the break, I guess, between the next uh, volume. Um. I mean, even this book was kind of expensive at the when it came out. Um, anyway, another interesting book, uh, Christian Markley's Fourth of July. Uh, this was taken in Hyde Park, New York, on a Fourth of July with a one of those bands walking by. It's a little like Charles Ives' piece, where you hear the music coming from the left and going to the right as the band goes by. Um, he took all these photographs and then he tore them and re re. Uh, um, I don't know, I, should, I think that other one is out of sequence. Anyway, um, as they go by, he, he highlights them and then puts them in different places. I, I really like this little book. Again, I think this one is still in print and it's not expensive. Um, if you don't have it, you might want to buy it. It's really good. Um, and so here are a few of my own books over the years um, and I'm gonna try to zip through it. Um, uh, this is an early one I did in the 90s called High Tension, and it's a shaped book. You can see how the, the pieces are die cut. It's about, it's an investigation of stress, um, and which is part of the reason for this is it's supposed to be like, you know, <laughs> uh, stress telling you apart. And it starts out with a description of um, clinical uh, uh, um, descriptions of stress, grind your teeth, get the chills, while in your stool, nervously eat too much, gain weight, uh, nauseous and so on. And then um, you can see here where there's many layers being displayed at once. So because of the die cutting of the shaped pages, you can see not only the pages before, but also the pages coming up. And then occasionally they'll form a picture over the whole thing. Through. And then at a certain point, um, it changes, and then you start having um, sort of tongue-in-cheek um, solutions to stress. You think, if I slept uh, on a firmer mattress, everything would be okay. If I could get my palm red, if I could be more flexible, everything would be okay, and so on. So it goes through there. Um, if I put work out of my mind, everything would be okay. Um, uh, this was published uh, in Rochester as part of a festival of the image there. And um, I got a lot of orders from um, psychologists, believe it or not, who said they wanted to have them in their waiting room, which I thought was super weird. <laughs> but anyway, uh, because they were patently un, uh, sort of silly, uh, you know, solutions to stress. 
Um, this one's called Long Story Short, which is sort of an autobiographical piece that I co-published with Nexus Press in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, uh, the, the text is um, all sort of aphorisms or little truisms, like starting from scratch, scratching the surface, scratch, you know, unfortunately, I can't see the right side of my page because of the, um, I get to pick people. So I, um, anyway, living and learning, letting her rip. So the, the narrative is told by using learning the ropes, seeing how the land lies there. It opens up all the flaps open up so that the, you know, doing as the Romans do, doing a good turn and so on. Flying, flying the colors, flying by night, flying the coop, um, flying by the seat of pants, anyway. Um, and there was, this was done, um, there's, a, a, there's a hand in every image. And this was done by um, taking um, uh, very small images out of Look and Life magazines and National Geographic magazines from 1951, which is the year I was born and then um, blowing them up huge. So the hands kind of take the pick, take, tell the story along with the text. Um, this is uh, another one that I did, Nature Abhors, uh, as Nature Abhors a Vacuum. And um, let's see if this works. Yeah. So this book works as a codex and as sort of a, an accordion full book. This is a little animation was done by a, a friend of mine in San Francisco that does 3D animation, but it's a good way to show how the book kind of works. Um, so there, there are elements of sort of animation in it and and you know the way the sequences work with the plane landing, but it can also be viewed as a traditional codex book with this this um, sort of uh, spine that goes through the whole book. Um, this is another one, Shelter, and this is a book that has a book within a book. Um, so I don't know this. I'll show you. There's a little video. I won't go through the whole video, but um, it's a little hard to tell what's going on here. There's a narrative in text below, uh, but this this central book here turns at the same pace as the outer pages. Now if that sounds a little confusing. Um, I'll show you the video. I wanted to show you these sort of flat ones because the color is much better on these. Um, this is the video, so you can sort of. Um, I won't let it go through the whole thing, but I just want you to sort of see how the, the book within the book works. So um, I'm just gonna do a few minutes of that. Um, okay, maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna scrub through here. Oh, there, so there you can see how that works. Um, so, there's actually an image on the underside also with other text um, underneath that V-shaped mountain. Um, anyway, you get the idea. Um, this is a book that I did uh, um, when I uh, first, uh, uh, forget what it went anyway um it it was a it was a reaction to living on the border here and um the the whole uh you know narrative of uh immigrants coming across and how they were taking jobs away from americans and and yet so many of them were dying in the desert crossing the desert uh and so the the uh, I made it like a breviary, and it, the book itself is meant to be almost performed uh, like a um, like a preacher reading out um, something. Th this is the picture of the, the cover flat out, which is the desert near, um, well, it's near Ajo, actually. <laughs> but um, so it starts out with the mud here. And then the idea, the concept of the book is that it's one day in the life of an immigrant walking through the desert. So it starts at daybreak. And then it goes through the day, but it's all told through cloud pictures. 
And then this text where you have, uh, this is a two page spread, it's, it's a board book. So there's no gutter. So it's all the things that Mexican workers do here that mostly Americans don't want to do. Um, fence menders, day laborers, dishwashers. And then as the day goes along, um, well, I, I obviously can't show the whole thing. It's, there's a 96 pages, but um, the, there's a pause here. Uh, there's a pause and then and then it goes, let us forgive Los Coyotes, let us forgive the Border Patrol. This is language that comes out of um, a Christian breviary. Uh, let's forgive the Minutemen, let's forgive La Migra, amen. And then that's the end of the day. <clears throat> so anyway, that's that one. Uh, this is a book called Celsius 233, which is a play on Fahrenheit 451. You know, the whole idea that Ray Bradbury had behind Fahrenheit 451 was that was the temperature that paper burst into flame. If you had an oven and you turned it up to 450, it actually turns out to actually not be true, but that's what he claimed it was. Um, so I, I made the, I used a, an equivalent in Celsius 233, which is the same as Fahrenheit 451. And um, it's a collection of books uh, or images of book burnings through time. Um, and I love that quote, where books are burned, in the end, people will be burned too, uh, which is Heinrich Heine. And anyway, it starts out with, obviously, this is pre-photography. <laughs> so, um, and I have a little sort of fire flap in there, and the type is laser burned into the pages. And the first two lines uh, are for the left side, or verso, and the recto, or the recto, and this the verso is when it's turned, that is on the other side. So anyway, it goes through with the little flags. These are obviously Nazis, but I have lots of other ones. Those are obscene books bring, being burned in a police station in New York City. Uh, oh, this one here is burning D.H. Lawrence books in Scotland. Um, anyway, it goes on and on. So you get the picture. And um, I have a close up here so you can see some of the pages have more of the laser burn of the text through it. Um, Landscapes of the Late Anthropocene. This is sort of one of my more manipulated photo, photo pieces. Uh, these are NASA uh, or NOAA pictures of um, water uh, 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 depths. And um, the book is basically um, contemplating uh, or considering a future where all of the oceans have risen. It's a dis, sort of a dystopian book um, where there, I used uh, airplane control towers, uh, which I took photographs of as these, uh, the idea is that this is where people are left to live in the future when the oceans have risen. And um, there's a text there too. So I took photographs of water and then I used 19th century cuts and sort of Photoshopped them in with these, uh, these airplane towers, uh, airplane control towers that are now where people live in vertical farming and so on. It's sort of science fiction, but anyway, you get the idea here. Um, Uh, this is the the my most recent book. Um, again, I've, I'm only doing uh, four uh, four or five books. Um, this one is um, Delirium, and this is a very large book, um, and it's my response to being uh, in the pandemic. Um, I collected photographs. Uh, they're not really photographs. They're digital illustrations. This is these are not not really photographs. But um, they're, they're um, illustrative models of the virus. And I, I scanned them in and then in Photoshop uh, manipulated them. And, um, and then I used a text from um, um, uh, um, Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment. There's an 1866 quote, which is chilling and how prescient it is. Um, he had dreamed that the whole world was doomed to fall victim to some terrible as yet unknown and unseen pestilence spreading to Europe from the depths of Asia. 
Everyone was to perish except for certain very few chosen ones. Some new trichina had appeared, microscopic creatures that lodged themselves in men's bodies. But these creatures were spirits endowed with reason and will. Uh, those who received them into themselves immediately became possessed and mad. Anyway, it's kind of astounding that this text, which is from 1866, so closely uh, mimics our situation today, or talks, reflects our situation today. Um, this is a, a video, but I'm, I'll just show you um, just so very quickly. Um, the color is not as good on this as on this flat ones, but you, you can see, um, I, I, it just does not come across the book. I, can you see my picture on the, I don't know if you yeah. can see that, but the book is much, much, it's very large. So unfortunately nothing comes across on Zoom <laughs> calls like, which is why I showed the video. So sorry, but um, I apologize. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in any of my other books, um, my website has um, uh, a lot of, you know, I've done my 30 some, 37 books, 38 books. I've actually published some other people's books too. And every one of the of these has a video and all the pages. So if you're interested at all. So um, uh, following along with what I was talking about with Richard, um, we I wanted to talk just a little bit uh, about distributing your photo book and getting exposure. Um, you know, obviously, um, um, Mary Virginia Swanson, Swanee, I don't know if you, you probably, a lot of you probably know her, I think she's part of this group, um, knows a huge amount about this. And I'm talking more about a specific kind of uh, independent photo book, not necessarily the radiuses and the, you know, the, the bigger aperture publishers who have their own publishing <clears throat> mechanisms. Now, DAP is the largest art book di uh, distributor in the world, but they don't usually take small um, publishers. Um, they do have some like the Ice Plant and GRP Ringer and Radius, uh, which they consider smaller and, they, and Scheidel and so on. But, um, you know, it is really hard to get your books out. Uh, Ingram is another huge publisher. Again, they don't usually, unless you're publishing several thousand books, they are probably not going to be the ones who will take your book on. Also, um, most of these distributors will take 60% of the cost of the book. That's a huge amount of your, so you have to be very careful about your, your production costs because when you lose 60% of that to the distributor, um, you know, you, you, you have to have a um, a production per unit cost that's relatively low. And that's always a problem with digital print on demand, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, you can also go to book fairs, um, New York Art Book Fair and Los Angeles Art Book Fair. There's huge photo book sec sections of those fairs. Um, and of course, photo Paris photo. Oops, I got that wrong. It shouldn't be photo Paris, it's Paris photo. But anyway, New York Art Book Fair, just some show, showing you a few clips of, of them. They're huge crowds of people, uh, uh, very popular with the youth, but unfortunately most of the people are not buying. <laughs> so that's always a problem, but for exposure, it's good. You can get a lot of exposure at these. Codex um, has some photo books, but less than the ones that are put together by uh, printed matter, which are the New York and LA. There's, there's lots of them now. So what about print on demand? This is a huge topic. I actually have done a whole uh, hour long talk on just that. Um, and I'm sure you're all probably familiar with them. They've been around quite a long time now. Lulu was the first. Um, but there's two main modes of thinking about print on demand services. One, as a publishing venue, because most of them you can actually buy books from them. And of course, as a production service. Um, this is the old fashioned way. This is the VSW Heidelberg, which they don't have anymore. It's now down at SUNY Purchase. But um, this is, uh, you can see the huge piles of paper there, very expensive. Uh, you generally never want to use uh, offset unless it's a, a over 500 or 1000 copies of the book. And uh, digital printing has definitely uh, moved in on, on it. As a, as a very um, good alternative to the cost of offset. 
Lulu is probably the first. They use a um, an mm -hmm. iGen printing machine to make their books. They're pretty good quality. Um, they're not quite as good as the HP Indigo uh, print engine. Um, and one of the main problems with all of these, MagCloud, which is now owned by Blurb, and MagCloud uses HP Indigo. Uh, they're very inexpensive, which is nice. Uh, but again, here's the problem. Almost all of these, uh, you have to work within their formats, eight by eight or you know, eight and a half by 10 or um, their limited number of sizes. So that might be okay for you, but if you wanna work in an unusual format or with um, uh, another problem is paper, of course. And Blurb now will print on Mohawk Superfine and um, a very nice, some very nice digital papers, but they're unbelievably expensive. So if you make a book that's say, um, you know, 90 pages or something, it can cost you $40 a book. Now that's almost impossible to sell if you're trying to sell it in any way other than directly to a buyer. So that's a huge problem. Uh, and a lot of the other papers that they sell are not really, really very nice papers. Um, anyway, I don't think so. They tend to be rather slick, shiny coated stock and often rather thin. Um, there are some nicer papers, but of course, again, you pay for them if you, if you have to. Now, another thing I want to mention is um, it's really advantageous if you know how to use Adobe InDesign to format your book because they all have their own proprietary uh, book software, but it's much better to use um, uh, Adobe InDesign and make your own. Um, and also Blurb does have large order services. They'll even actually uh, um, uh, broker the, the production and print it offset for you. They don't do it themselves, they, they shop it out. Now, I'm not even gonna go into the whole thing of printing offshore because it's a huge, huge topic. And if you have the money, uh, which usually, you know, for most offset books start at about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars and go up from there, and because that's part of that is because they won't print smaller numbers. And um, the last thing you want is to have a garage full of books that you can't move because you don't have a larger distributor or whatever. Anyway, don't want to be uh, pessimistic, but. Um, I mentioned book, uh, show Bookmobile here because they're one of the more interesting, they're a little more expensive, but they're much more customizable. They'll do, um, for instance, they'll do foil stamping on the cover and so on. Anyway, um, here are just a few of the other output engines and technologies. These are HP Indigo, um, and there's actually even newer ones than this. And they'll, some of them will do uh, white ink, which is kind of cool. Um, Xerox iGen, this is what Lulu uses. Uh, Fuji and Kodak both have their own versions of high-speed inkjet, which is a technology that they've been saying is about to revolutionize printing for the last 25 years. And it never seems to get there. But anyway, um, it's, it's an interesting option. And then... And most um, our, uh, anyone who's making zines knows about a risograph. It's a very weird hybrid technology that uses sort of a silkscreen process and a stencil. And um, it does do photographic imagery, but uh, the finest halftone screen you can do is 110 lines per inch, which is pretty coarse. So if you want high high reproduction values in, in terms of your photographs or risograph probably isn't the way to go. They do have a bunch of different models and it is high speed. And the nice thing about it is that uh, almost anyone can run a riso press, which is very attractive to a lot of artists. And there are photographers who have really gotten into it. Uh, Heidelberg digital printing, it's kind of not, not, not happening especially either, it's very expensive. Uh, and then for the very last part, oh good, I'm ending just about an hour and a half. I uh, hope you're <laughs> all in here still. <laughs> I wanted to mention Spoonflower, which is really interesting. It's a digital uh, fabric wallpaper 
And uh, you can actually do photographs, uh, again, core screen, but this is, uh, I mentioned Clifton Metter. Uh, this is intentionally a core screen, but this was done, this is a cloth done by Sp Spoonflower, and then he used it to cover his heart, his book, his hardcover book. So just something to consider if you're interested in doing fabric, it's surprisingly cheap. Uh, oh, okay, so one, this is the last thing. <laughs> um, a lot of people go, okay, if I use these print on demand services where I'm stuck with a certain format, how do I get out of, how, do I, how can I use something that's not all either square, eight by eight or 10 by 10 or eight and a half by 11? Well, if you do um, have um, Adobe InDesign, you can set it up so that this is an example of Scott McCartney um, using, uh, I think this was done in MagCloud, where he ordered these books as um, uh, saddle stitched, right? So they're, they're stapled, but then they're intended to be cut apart and then rebound. So you can get two books out of the same one. And so it's kind of clever ways uh, to get around that. This is a book that I did um, a few years ago by, Lu I think, no, this was Mad Cloud also, but I ordered um, a, a perfect bound book, but then I put a hardcover on it. And then I also used a, a black and white Sharpie to do the edges to make it look different. It doesn't, this book does not have that kind of print on demand look to it. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> so I'm going to get out of the, the stop share here. <clears throat> or try to. If I can find my, oh, there we go. Okay. So, well, that, was, that was great. Uh, I feel yeah, like a lot that, of ground. <laughs> I just went an hour and a half with an evangelist. Um, yeah, but I, I have like two pages of notes uh, of things I had not been aware of. You know. um, I did want to kind of go back to the very beginning of your talk and it, it felt a little dismissive about like web-based things. Uh oh, uh, okay. Uh, I wonder if you, uh, I, I'm putting a little bit of energy in that direction myself. I'll just oh. say that. Um, and I, I wonder if you, sort of are as enthusiastic about the kinds of things that are happening on the web. And if you keep track of, of them as, as well as you do the, the kind of uh, ink on paper um, world. Now, when you, when you say web-based, are you talking about sort of Instagram or? No, I'm thinking about like a kind of a, a story-based, um, you know, scrolling website, you know, the kind of storytelling website. Uh, yeah. And what I'm working on, and I, I do know that, you know, in the future, nobody will be able to see it. Um, you know, that seems preordained. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems really, you know, well, um, you could distribute what the images more simply. Um, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so that's actually, a huge, that's a huge value. Uh, the yeah. cost is, is not prohibitive, obviously. Um, although getting your profile and uh, your, you know, getting viewed is not always necessarily that easy either. But yeah, um, I, see, I, 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 I totally like that. I, I don't see it as books, though. I see it as publishing, yeah. but not as books. Now, there are a lot of people who totally disagree with me there. So I don't know. Do you think of them as books? Well, I, th I think of them as alternatives to books, I suppose, you know, yeah. as a as a, uh, you know, I look at the economics of book publishing and I don't like what I see. Uh, and I know lots of people who have garages full of books. Uh, and, you know, so, but I mean, I've had to hire somebody to sort of teach me how to do this. And I think by the time it's all said and done, I don't know if it won't be a wash economically. Um, what are you, I'm, I'm definitely curious about it. What, what, are, what is, are you using WordPress or something like that? Or It's called Webflow. Was oh, oh. Yeah, but it's, you know, like um, a lot of people will know the New York Times has been doing some kind of scrolling features. Yeah, recently. they're fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm kind of inspired by that. Um, mm -hmm. And but I do think of them as as a narrative, uh, as an alternative way. I mean, you have to one thing that's really frustrating or, or at least 
entirely different um, is you have to let go of a format that everybody is seeing um, because there'll be people who are looking on on a phone in you know in Shanghai and there will be people looking at a desktop in Germany and and people who have their you know their bookmarks open on the left hand side so you really have to sort of let go of that kind of composition of the image um, yeah. Yeah. yeah but um but I, I'm, I'm interested in the sort of format and I don't know that, you know, I just wondered if you had a, a source or a place that you look at for things like no. that. No, I mean, I, I, I'm very, very interested in that. In fact, um, you know, we have a photojournalism school here, which is separate from the art department. And I do know some of the faculty over there and um, they teach, they call they consider that long form journalism, those, you know, yeah. those, scrolling yep. images with yep. the text and the, it's really interesting yeah. i just think of it as a different animal sort of yeah <laughs> i don't know yeah there's a lot of overlap though i think yeah. you know juxtaposition of text and and yeah. image in the service of a narrative so yeah. yeah okay anybody have any other questions or yeah i have a question about uh, uh, have you seen anything about uh, canon's pod no, I don't know. Uh, uh, is that a new a new printer? Well, uh, no, I, it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a an application, I guess. Oh. I got it. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it looks like something along the line of a blurb, but it it was from Canon, hmm. and I had not. I didn't know if you've heard anything about that at all. I haven't. I, I should look into it. Yeah. Phil, have you heard of um, short short run digital printing? Um, uh, of what type, though? I think it's different than like uh, Indigo. I think oh. that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out about it. And I've seen some books, like I'm looking at stuff at uh, Photo Eye, you know, this is a while ago, but when I was in their bookstore, um, trying to figure out how they were printed. Some of these artist books that are really only in edition of maybe 500 or 300 or something like that. And I, I don't think they're using the Indigo. And I think there, there are some companies that advertise short run digital printing, and I'm not sure what that is. I don't think it's offset, but I'm not sure it's Indigo either. And I just was curious about that. Well, I know there's some other, um, there's some other companies besides Indigo that are producing really high quality digital printing. Um, one of them is the Rico. Um, you know, they make, they make, laser printers and stuff. In fact, my color laser printer is a Rico. But um, I've seen uh, the the product from some of those, they're, they're, fin they're really high quality. Maybe that's what I'm seeing because I was I was really stunned at how good it was mm -hmm. that it wasn't offset. And I just wondered what the- What was the paper like? Was. Yeah. What was the paper like? Uh, pretty good. I'm yeah. not sure what it was exactly, but it, it wasn't your standard. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of companies out there, like Edition One and other companies that are. Edition like, One is you know, like a good one. Yeah, yeah. We'll use Edition One. Yeah. yeah, and you know they'll even proof for you, and you know I mean I think right. there's there's other companies out there. I just think it's it's really interesting. I, uh, first of all, I just want to comment. I mean I, that was an amazing set of pick of books you got. I mean it's just. <laughs> it was, I, I I actually uh, spent yesterday evening like deleting <laughs> tons of stuff so you be be happy oh, no, I, I, <laughs> it could have gone, really, could have gone a lot longer it was a great, it was a great selection it's amazing i was oh, gonna, thank you thank i was kind of struck at um how like some of the early photo books you know i when i'm thinking of like elliot porter's place no one knew i mean they were printing on <laughs> color images on a paper that was one-sided you know yeah so it made sense to have the picture on the right the text mm -hmm. on the left and and it was a fairly simple design, but but yeah. then you get to something like Bill Burke when he was working with Nexus Press, which I guess you worked at, you know, yeah. that he was able to do that stuff because he was on press. I mean, that was like a commissioned thing. I mean, he's there making it up as he goes, you know, that's they're, they're, no, that's they're very true. pasting it up and putting it into the copy camera. And, and in some ways it sort of was a predecessor of working digitally today. Yeah. You know, with a you know in a layout form 
using old school technology, but in a, in a new way. Uh, yeah. sort of in I'm just own. thinking about how that, you know, engendered different ways of looking at what a book could be, yeah. you know, because, and, and I'm just, you know, wondering, you know, how that's changing, how people understand what, what photo books are, because I, I kind of feel like some of the best work in photography is being done in photo books right now. I mean, I think it's an incredible genre. Yeah, yeah. It's it's super uh, popular with photographers. And I think that photographers in general are much more sophisticated about what books can be than they used to be even 15 years ago, I think. Um, and Radius is a great, you know, they've really raised the bar, I think. You know, David Chickie and yeah. uh, Darius is no longer there, but... Um, I, I don't know. And and you are certainly part of that. Like um, you've done a number of books that are just, they're not in that old school <laughs> way of thinking of photo books. Well, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's what I think working with like David Chickie as a designer, yeah. that's the way he works. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I don't know if you know much about this, but I'll throw it out there. that um, It seems like in other places, like in Europe and in, parts of South America, and there, there are small consortiums of artists that get together and kind of form their own little publishing company. Yeah, there's yeah. a really famous one in Europe called ABC, Artist Book Collective. Yeah. And it's a bunch of, uh, Mishka Henner is, is part of that. And um, that's exactly it. It's a collective to, to you know, get together and promote. And, and it's very nice for them because They'll take turns going to all the art book fairs and sharing, you know, the responsibility. I, I wish we had something like that. Well, here. That, I guess that was my point. You know, I'm thinking of Christina de Middle too, and then yeah. and Spain. And I'm thinking, why don't we do that in this country? I mean, why don't we form small consortiums of artists who want to publish and and find ways to do that? You know, and support yeah. and support the work ourselves. Have you thought about that at all? I mean, you, you kind of do stuff yourself. I mean, I'm amazed at what you can produce just yourself. Well, yeah, I mean, I, um, I used to run an offset press myself, so I could do some of my own printing, but I don't have access to the presses anymore. So now a lot of the stuff I do is in very small amounts and I run it on my, you know, Epson printer. It's, it's not ideal <laughs> at all. Uh, or I will buy HP Indigo printing from a printer here. But um I, I wish I had buying power and it's so expensive to, I mean, everyone thinks, oh, go to China or Singapore or Italy and print a book. Well, it's, you got a lot of money to do that. How did you, I mean, I, I love that book, um, Sonorensis. I forgot, I get the title. Yeah, Sanctus Sonorensis. And, and, yeah. and my students have really benefited from that book you did. But oh. I mean, that's a beautiful production. And how did you, I mean, how did you get the money? How did you produce that? Um, well, um, I'll tell you how I got the money. I sold my house in New York when I moved. To <laughs> uh, I, I seriously, I would not have had the money if I hadn't sold my house to move here. Um, mm -hmm. That I can tell you all the costs there. Um, I had a student at SUNY Purchase who, uh, let, you know, because we used to teach offset to the designers, uh, they had kind of a leg up in a lot of areas because they really knew production. So she got a, she got a job uh, first at Abrams and then at CNC Offset, which is a huge printer in China. They're one of those places where they have a printing village and the whole town, all they do is print books. And it's very grim. She's gone there many times to supervise books. Anyway, they have an office in New York and she got a job there. So she said, uh, if you ever want to print a book in China, I can get you a good price on it. Mm -hmm. And um, that book, I actually wanted to print in Mexico because it's about, yeah. you know, it would have been perfect, you know, but um, I wanted it to be a board book because I wanted to gold leaf the edges and so on. And I tried finding a printer in New York City, I mean, in Mexico, and they said, no way, you're going to have to go to China for that. So uh, she got me a, a quote and it was $12,000, which was a good price exactly. for that. And, but I had to print a thousand of them. Yeah. So that was $12,000, 12, a thousand copies. It's $12 a book. So the rule of thumb is you, you have to charge 
um, five times the, the unit cost for your retail price. So I didn't think I could do that and sell books. So I just said 50 bucks. Um, but of course, that's not what I get after the $12. First of all, you send out books for review. If you're selling through a dealer, they take 40 to 50%. Um, you know, I, I don't make real, I don't really don't make much money. And I, I still have 250 copies of it in boxes in my closets, you know? Uh, so it, you know, I don't know. You have to think about that. Do you have a warehouse or a storage unit that you can put boxes of books in and who, who is it who, you know, ships it for you? I saw most of the, my books through a, um, a book dealer in Birmingham, Alabama called Vamp and Tramp, terrible name. Um, but they are the largest artist bookseller in the world. They sell a lot of books, not photo books. Uh, they do have some photo books, but mostly just artist books. And I make that differentiation because they're mostly small run, often handmade books. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I, it's not like I make a lot of money from them. I maybe, I, I don't care about telling you what I make. Um, so I make maybe twenty thousand dollars a year from sales from them if I'm lucky. Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Actually, no, it's yeah. not terrible. It's pretty good. <laughs> Philip, do you um, need to do a, like a DAP distributor as well if you're using this Vamp and Tramp or? Um, well, the problem is um, DAP won't take uh, low run books. You you have to sell, uh, you, you have to print at least a thousand usually for DAP. Mm -hmm. The irony is um, I am best friends with the two owners of DAP, oh, wow. <laughs> Scooter mm -hmm. Helgeson and Sharon. Uh, mm -hmm. But the problem is, is they, they don't do favors for me. And they've told me, I'm sorry, but we can't handle your book. Plus, they take uh, they would take fifty eight percent, something like that. Oh my gosh! But that's true of all distributors. Now they do they do DP does have they sell the ice plant books they do they sell radius they sell Steidel, but um, all those people they make thousands they make you know Steidel. I don't think he prints anything under probably I don't know what their runs are but they're usually a couple thousand three thousand. And I, I just, uh, I, yeah, can't do it. Yeah. DP would be the way to go, but um, it's okay. I don't take it personally. I understand. <laughs> I mean, this book uh, is kind of ridiculous. It's 30, <laughs> edition of 30. And I, I, I hand bind it, so. Uh, wow. I couldn't. I couldn't sell through them anyway. So. Wow. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I I have one more follow up. One of the many interesting tidbits of information I I got from the pro the, the program was that Ed Ruscha continues to photograph on the Sunset Strip. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. really surprising to me. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't even know that. A few couple of years ago, um, CBAA, which is this other organization that I'm part of, College Book Art Association, it's kind of it's kind of like SBE, but mm -hmm. for but for uh, artist books. And we did a, a one conference on just Ed Ruscha. And um, I did a whole thing on him and he came. It was very hard to get him, but somebody was friends with him. And so he came and we interviewed him and uh, he's a real character. He had a hip flask of vodka that he kept you know, <laughs> drinking from the whole time. Anyway, um, at the same time, we all went to the Getty Research Center, which has all his materials. <clears throat> and they said, hey, um, you want to see some of the other pictures that Ed took of the Sunset Strip over the years? And we all went, what? He, he's, <laughs> he did it again? And he, oh, yeah, he does it every year. That's and... Uh, <laughs> So we saw all these other photographs that he'd been taking. Um, for a while, he did it in a pickup truck with a tripod screwed to the yeah. But apparently, he does it now in a van <clears throat> with a window. Um, but he did skip a few years, but he still does it. He's a really he interesting was, guy. Yeah. I mean, that's just uh, that just kind of cuts against what I think of him as doing. But um, 
do you think he has plans to publish that or or, or... i don't think so i don't know i don't wow. know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually that'd be interesting to approach him yeah <clears throat> I mean, if you look at the uh, the first the original of every building on Sunset Strip, it's it's from it's like time work that 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 city does not exist anymore. It's yeah. so changed. Yeah. So it actually would be interesting. Um, Maybe one by the way, his um, his brother, Paul, um, was his assistant for 40 years <clears throat> and it was also collected art. And um, do you, any of you know Winslow? you know, standing on the corner, it's right on Route yeah, 66. Yeah. So one of the gas stations is in Winslow that he took. And uh, his brother, Paul, uh, bought this, what used to be a um, car repair place. It's a Quonset hut. And he still owns it. And it's packed with, Paul's retired now. He doesn't work for Ed. But it's full of all uh, Paul's artwork. And he still is there half the time. <laughs> Wow. So if you go up, you can knock on the door and see if Paul's around. Um, and it's not Ed, it's his brother, but he's <laughs> actually very interesting. And Ed, he actually published a book of all the, the artwork that he collected as um, Ed's, you know, assistant. Like stuff by Baldessari and uh, uh, what's his name? Ro um, Petty. Uh, Petty. Oh, Pettibone. Yeah. Yes, Pettibone. Yeah. Pettibone. yeah. Yeah, he's really yeah. good friends with with. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I have a I have a question about your book. I think it was um, Nature of Horrors, the book within a book. A Nature of Horrors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how do you, how do you see the image on the back of that centerfold? Oh, or, or oh, you're talking. Are you, wait, are you talking about, I think you're talking about Shelter that has the, the book that changes at the same time. Um, oh, I don't know. It had, a, it had a, uh, a photo, In a court, like a, a book inside a book, I think you called it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, um, you couldn't see it there because it was being photographed from straight above. But if you take the book and you look at it, you can actually see behind that, that fold. So it's a little hard to follow the text, but you can see it. Okay, thank you. Hey, I have another quick question. So do uh, photo art photo books, do they sell on Amazon? Well, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I mean, it, I guess it depends on the kind of photo book you're talking about. Um, uh, I think any of the major publishers, yes, you, you can buy them on there. Um, some of them you can't, um, but, um, you know, I, I don't really look for, to buy books on Amazon of that kind, but, um, I know, I know you can buy some of them. For instance, um, uh, some of the books I mentioned that are still in print, you, you can buy them because Amazon has all these links to other, uh, people, what do they call them? Um. There's a name. Uh, Affiliate, affiliates? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Affiliate, yeah. yeah. Like, and they own, a, Amazon owns ABE Books, which is also sells a lot of smaller mm -hmm. uh, collectible books. Yeah, I was, so, just, I, was, I was just looking for the Doug Aitken book, Alpha. Yes, Did you, is it, it still out there? It was on Amazon, but it was a hundred and some dollars. And oh, I found it on wow. ABE Books for, you know, like new for just almost half that. Ah. So I just scooped it up, but I was looking for the uh, the Nameless Dead as well, but I couldn't find that one. That one, um, that one has a story behind it. It was published by a um, independent publisher in Connecticut, and he stopped publishing. And apparently there's something like um, 800 copies of that in this guy's garage and he won't, he won't release them. Uh, yeah. It's very um, uh, Clifton Metter is extremely annoyed at this guy because he doesn't have any copies left to sell and this guy won't release them. I don't, I don't know why uh, he makes his money on um, yoga instruction tapes. Now <laughs> this guy. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I guess there's much better money in that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that because The Nameless Dead is a fantastic book. 
Um, yeah, it, it changes all the time, uh, the availability. Uh, what, 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 the, which one was it that you were looking up? The, was it the Doug Aiken book, Alpha? Was that the one that was $100 or something? Yeah. And oh, okay. AB books. It was. Yeah. Because yeah. last year, um, last year I bought a second copy of that one because they were, my first copy had been sort of destroyed by students handling it. And I, I think I paid $27 or $28 for it. Yeah. And maybe it was, you know, it changes all the time. Yeah, and they had some new copies, which is what I got, that were 50 or under. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, well thanks. Thanks for uh, getting up to date on those. So. Are there any other questions? Well, thank, thank you so much. We uh, managed to fill just about two hours there. So yeah. That was a really great Close. tour of, uh, of book publishing and, and so many great ideas, uh, you know, and, and things to follow up on. Um, and I'm glad that it was recorded so that we could, you know, refer to that in the future uh, when we can't quite remember a title or a, or a photographer. Uh, I, I will try to get together a list of the books. Um, but Richard, maybe you could also, I don't know if you can send out that PDF that I gave you also. Yeah, you, I will. Yeah. I'll send it out to the attendees. Yeah, yeah. That, that was cool. Um, there's one thing in there that that also is, is kind of interesting is, um, and this is kind of marketing. And so I, you know, you can't really um, fault people for doing this, but it's very normal for, um, it's not just photographers, but it's it's just reg any any artist publishing a, a book of their work, they'll often hire somebody to write an introductory essay. And it's usually they usually try to find somebody with a name to do it. And often you have to pay them and so on. And um, I have that as one of the distinctions between sort of more pure form artist books versus more traditional artist books. And I, again, I have no... Um, I have no, um, I, I don't have any um, derogatory or, or uh, opinion of that. I think uh, in many cases, you kind of have to do that or, or it really helps in the sales. But mm -hmm. for me, um, that it really detracts from a book to have um, a third party essay or something about the work because I, I, I personally do not want that in my books. But I understand that. And I, I think it's actually, um, well, you know, it ends up all being about, you know, the money and the, if you can afford to publish it. And it, it's not maybe even a decision that's made by the photographer or whoever is doing it, but by the publisher. So that's another whole thing is do you self-publish or do you find a publisher to, to publish anyway? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really hard. <laughs> it's it's a hard thing to do, and uh, you know there's a the, the old joke is there's no money in books, and uh, the people who make the money are the large publishers that are on the you know the top ten New York Times bestseller list. They're making a lot of money, um, so everyone thinks well you know there must be money in books because how can they offer you know. Uh, I don't know, uh, Obama, a $3 million advance or something. Yeah. Well, of course there is money in that kind of publishing. Yeah. <laughs> but for well, us, small it, fry. <laughs> you know, I think that, um, I mean, I think that Brooks Jensen published an essay, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago about the sorry state of the book publishing economics, but he completely left out the idea that you can't have a meaningful career without a book, you know? I mean, there that's part of the economics as well. It's, yes. not, uh, yes. it's not just the cost of production and what you get no. at the end of your net. Well, and, and that is still yeah. that is yeah. still true. A lot of um, galleries will pay for the book because right. the gallery knows that that's a way to raise a profile. Yeah. And even now, I mean, uh, that's one of the other dirty little secrets, like Aperture, a lot of the monographs they... Uh, publish that's all subsidized by the gallery by galleries yeah 
um, that's never mentioned because it's not considered, you know, mm -hmm. um, something that the artist necessarily wants to be out there. But um, that's it's what is called subvention. I think that's right. the, the term for it. Yeah. And things would <laughs> Abrams was like that. All those publishers like that. Abrams has all these artist books. They, those would never see the light of day unless a museum or a gallery was paying the subvention fees for the publishing. So um, if you're doing artist books, there's no subvention fee. Right. right. Yeah. Anyway. Well, well, thanks so much. Well, that, was, um, that was really great. Glad to yeah. do it. Glad to do yeah. it. Thanks for having me. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.